Hello, everyone. Just wanted to make sure is my screen visible to you all? Guys, am I audible? Yes, so first of all, I'd like to welcome you all to the machine learning marathon by GDSC ADGITM, day one, introduction to machine learning. So introducing myself, my name is Nandini Singh. I am a SOPA mode at ADGITM, and I've been working with GDSC ADGITM's AIML team for the past six to eight months. I also have the machine learning specialization by Stanford Deep Learning AI. So let's start with the session. So have you guys ever heard about the humanoid robot? Uh, it's named Sophia. You must have heard about it. It's very famous. And we all know about Tesla, right? We all know about chat GPT. And have you ever thought how YouTube or uh, Instagram or Spotify is always recommending you content, which is very similar to the content that you have already interacted with? So all these things have one thing in common, that is machine learning. All these applications are using machine learning. So let's talk about the buzzwords in the tech industry today. So we have artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. Now, the biggest confusion is what is the difference between these three? So let's discover what's the difference. When we talk about artificial intelligence, Artificial intelligence is something which enables machines to mimic human behavior. When we talk about Sophia, it is a robot, but it works just as human. So that is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence can be seen as a sub, as a superset, which is containing machine learning and deep learning. So when we talk about machine learning, it is a subset of artificial intelligence. In machine learning, you are using statistical mathematical tools to build models which actually learn from their previous experiences to improve their performance with time. And then we have deep learning. Now, deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Deep learning uses artificial neural networks to analyze and learn from the data it is provided. Now, since the session is about introduction to machine learning, let's dive into the depth of machine learning. So uh, we as humans have evolved so much from the Stone Age, right? We have learned a lot from our past experiences. And we, as humans, give instructions to machines to perform certain tasks. But what if we had robots which would actually learn from their past experiences? And then they, along with this experience and with passing time, they improve their performance. So that is exactly what machine learning is. In machine learning, you are not explicitly programming these machines that this is what you need to do, this is what you need to do. You are providing them data, and with this data, with their experience, they improve over time. Now, machine learning is divided into three types. The first is supervised machine learning, then we have unsupervised machine learning, and then we have reinforcement learning. So when talking about supervised machine learning, it is a type of learning in which an ML model is trained based on label data. Here, you know the desired output already. But when it comes to unsupervised learning, you train the model based on unlabeled data. So you don't know the desired output in advance. And then we have reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, an agent or a model learns to take actions on the basis of the conditions, the current environmental conditions. So Let's talk about each of these in detail. So as we talked about supervised machine learning, in this type of learning, the data is uh, labeled and it is used to make predictions or classify the new data based on the patterns that we have already seen in the label data. Now, as you can see here on the screen, we have this infographic which shows us that we have elements which are named apple and then we have elements which are named banana. Now, you use this data to train a machine learning algorithm. And once it has been trained, suppose if you give it an unseen data, which is not labeled. So the what the machine model will do is it will find out the similarity between this and the training data. And as you can probably guess, there would be similarities between the banana and the unseen data that we have just given to the ML model. So it's going to predict it as a banana. 
So that is how basically a supervised machine learning algorithm works. So now let's look at the examples of supervised learning. So the first is spam filtering. We all use Gmail, right? So in Gmail, you have a lot of emails which come to your primary inbox, the important ones. And then you have some which move to the spam ones. So how does actually the Gmail know the, this is a spam one, this is a non-spam one? So it happens because of supervised machine learning. So how have we actually trained it? We actually gave the model a huge set of emails with labeled as spam or not spam. So once it has learned that, okay, this is the type of wordings or the format which is used in a spam email. So I'm going to detect this in the upcoming emails and then filter it whether it is a spam email or not. Then we have stock type price prediction. So in this, what we do is we use historical data. Suppose I have a stock and I have the value, the prices of that stock at different point of time. So I can use that historical data to predict the price of that stock in the future. Then we have image classification. As we saw in the first example where we had the apples and the bananas, we actually classify whether the unseen data that I'm given is of an apple or is it of a banana. So that is image classification. Then we have sentiment analysis. This is seems like a big term at first, but what it basically means is that you have to classify. For example, if I tweeted something, I tweeted, oh my God, it's a very sunny day. It's very beautiful outside. So it's going to analyze it and say that it's a positive statement. On the other hand, if I had tweeted something like, oh my God, it's very gloomy and the weather is not good. It's making me really sad. So it would classify it as a negative statement. So this would be sentiment analysis, like analyzing whether this is a positive statement, a negative statement, a happy one, or if it's racist or not. So that is supervised machine learning. So now the two main type of tasks in supervised machine learning are regression and classification. So when we talk about regression, in regression, you have continuous output variable. For example, if I have the price of something, if I have the height or weight of something, so that would come under regression. In regression, you are trying to find a mathematical relationship between the input variable and the output variable so that, you know, you get some formula out of it. If I had to predict the output of certain unseen variable, then how am I going to find it? So that is regression. Then we have classification. In classification, we have categorical output variables. So suppose I have genders, male and female. These are categories. If I give you a person and you are supposed to find out if it's a male or a female, that would be classification because it has got categorical variables. The example of the spam filtering that we talked about, that is also an example of classification because you're classifying whether it's a spam one or not. So let's look at this graph. This, uh, the first graph is of classification. Now, this black line you see over here is called the decision boundary. And as the name suggests, a decision boundary would help you in finding out whether a certain data point belongs to category A or category B. For example, let's state this is the decision boundary and this is group A and this is group B. Uh, if, say, this is the data point that I have to find out whether it's belonging to A or B, then I can use this decision boundary to find out whether it's from A or B. Now, as you can see, this data point would belong to category A. So this is an example of classification. Looking at regression, suppose this is all the data that we have been given. And with the help of this data, we found out a mathematical relationship between the input variable and the output variable, and we plotted this graph. So if suppose I've been given an input 50, and I have to find out the output, then I can use this graph to find out what's the output. Now, we have completed supervised machine learning here, and we should move on to unsupervised machine learning. So unsupervised machine learning is a type of machine learning in which the algorithm learns the patterns or the structure with the help of unlabeled data and without the supervision of a human expert. Now, the main difference between supervised machine learning and unsupervised machine learning is supervised uses labeled data, but unsupervised uses data which is not labeled. It has no predefined output or target variable. For example, let's see. Here we have input raw data, which is not labeled. It is not being labeled if this is an apple or if this is an orange. 
Once you feed this into the algorithm, it finds out that there's some similarity between these three because they have the same color, they have the same shape. So it classifies them into one group. So that would be apples. And similarly with the other ones, it would classify them as oranges. So this is basically how a supervised machine learning algorithm works. So talking about the examples of unsupervised machine learning, first we have clustering, like we saw. Clustering basically means you are grouping similar objects together on the basis of some similarity or distances between them. So the example that we previously saw, that is an example of clustering. Then we have dimensionality reduction, very huge term, but it's quite simple. So suppose you have a data set in which there's an output variable and it has uh, input variable, five input variables. So what you can do is instead of using these five to plot a graph, you can use three of them to create a graph. So that would reduce its dimensionality and its complexity. It would make it easier to visualize as well as understand. So that is dimensionality reduction. Then we have anomaly detection. Now, as we talked about earlier, in unsupervised learning, you are trying to find structures or patterns in the data. So suppose if I have a lot of data points here, and then I found out that there's a data point which is over here, which is like completely different from the trend. Then I know there's something wrong with the point, and I know that it's an anomaly. So that is anomaly detection. So this is a graph which shows clustering. Now, here you can see that we have grouped these data points on the basis of the distances between them. And this one is a graph of dimensionality reduction. As you can see, we earlier had two variables, x1 and x2. But later, we found out a third variable, which would be a single variable, which can be used to represent this whole thing. So that would be dimensionality reduction. And with that, we have completed unsupervised learning as well. Now, talking about reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is a type of machine learning in which an agent learns to take action according to the environmental variables at that environmental conditions at that point in order to maximize the tour. Okay, for example, a very simple, fun example. I am someone who is addicted to watching Instagram reels. Okay, so if I'm sitting in my room, binge watching reels, and I hear my mother coming into my room, so what's going to be what's going to be my instinct it's going to be like oh i should probably put my phone away and start studying because if she sees me studying then i'm going to be praised for that right that is my reward and if i don't then obviously i'm going to get a punishment so this is basically how reinforcement learning works you have an agent which is going to look at the environmental conditions and decide yes this is the action i'm going to take and this is and then once it performs the action and reaches another state, it's going to get either a reward or a punishment. So reinforcement learning is a type of reward-based learning because there's a feedback loop. You perform some action and then you get a feedback either in the form of reward or in the form of punishment. So the examples of reinforcement learning. First is game playing. We all have played chess with the computer, right? How does it know when to make which move? That is with the help of reinforcement learning. Then we have the uh, example of Sophia. It's a robot, but it has to learn how to walk, how to talk, how to like grab objects. It all has to be done with the help of reinforcement learning. Then we have Tesla, autonomous vehicles, uh, because these vehicles need to learn when to accelerate, when to apply the brakes. So it is also done with the help of reinforcement learning. Then we have recommendation system. Now, what does a recommendation system mean? A recommendation system is something which would recommend you similar elements or objects once you have interacted with elements that are similar to it. Suppose uh, if I'm on Spotify, I'm listening to sad songs, then it's going to recommend sad songs. Or suppose if I'm on Amazon and I'm looking for dresses for girls, so it's going to see that this particular person is in an environment of dresses for women or dresses for girls. So it's going to recommend me the dresses for girls to maximize its user engagement or revenue, that is the reward for it. So these are the examples of reinforcement learning. Now we have covered all three types of machine learnings in detail. So let's focus on the machine learning process. The infographic you see right now starts with step one, that is collection of data from various sources, and it goes until model deployment, that is the final step. So let's start with step one, that is collection of data from various sources. What does collection of data mean? As the name suggests, it's just finding out data from various sources. 
you need to understand what is the problem statement you have been given who are your stakeholders stakeholder basically means who are going to be the ones benefiting from this process so that is uh, the stakeholders and once you understand these two things you can collect data from various sources the one that i use is kaggle it has got a lot of data sets and you can also use data sets which are provided by government organizations and so that is collection of data now once you have collected the data the second step is data cleaning or feature engineering now a lot of data that we collect from third party organization is not fit for analysis from the very starting so we need to clean that data there are missing values so we have to data we have to perform data imputation sometime because if suppose i have 10 10 uh, entry fields and around uh, eight of them are field, filled and two of them are empty so how am i going to fill those so i can take the mean of the previous eight ones and then put it in the uh, empty one so that would be data imputation and suppose I can also have outliers. Suppose I have a certain thing which ranges from 10 to 50, but for some value it's given, for some entry it's given that its value is 500. So that is an outlier. So I need to remove it too. So that would be data cleaning. Now, along with data cleaning, you also need to transform your data because these third party organizations mostly provide you data which is not in a very good format. It's not structured really well. So you have to structure it according to your own needs. And then we have feature engineering. Feature engineering is very similar to the concept of dimensionality reduction. Here you have to find the most important features which would actually help you in creating a good machine learning model. And then we have step three that is model building. So you have, once you've collected the data and you understand what kind of data you have, you have performed analysis and you know what kind of output variable you need, you can decide what type of model you will require. So in order to train the model, you have to split the data set into two portions. For example, let's say 70% of the data you keep as training data. So you're going to use it to build, uh, to train a model. And then the 70, uh, the remaining 30% is going to be used to evaluate the model. So the fourth step is evaluating the model to understand how is the model performing. You can use the test data to find out how is the model performing. You can use accuracy, precision, and recall F1 score, a lot of uh, performance matrices to find out how the model is doing. And once you have obtained a good accuracy, for example, let's say 75 to 80%, then your model is good enough to deploy it for the uh, industry use. So that sums up the machine learning process. And uh, there are some challenges which we face in the machine learning industry. So let's talk about them. The first is data quality. Data is like the superpower when it comes to, and the most important thing when it comes to machine learning and the data science industry. So for example, let's say if I'm making a meal and I'm using vegetables which are not very good quality. So that means my meal is going to be bad, right? So in order to create a good model, you have to uh, take data which is very high in quality. So that would be data quality. Then we have data quantity. Why is data quantity important? Because in order to train a good machine learning model, you need to have an optimum, a good amount of data. And the problems that we face with less amount of data is uh, overfitting. Overfitting basically means when your data set is doing too good, extremely good on the training set, but it's not going, doing very good on the unseen data or the data that you're giving it to actually classify or find predict on after it's been trained so that will be overfitting of course when you have a very less amount of data and then we have underfitting which is the counterpart of overfitting now underfitting is basically when your model is doing good neither on the uh, training set nor on the test set so that is underfitting now with that uh, we have completed what is machine learning what are its different types what is the process like and what are the challenges so now I'd like to recap what we did. So let's recap with the help of some videos. Thank you. 
Our ability to learn and get better at tasks through experience is part of being human. When we're born, we know almost nothing and can do almost nothing for ourselves. But soon, we're learning and becoming more capable every day. But did you know that computers can do the same? Machine learning brings together statistics and computer science to enable computers to learn how to do a given task without being programmed to do so. Just as your brain uses experience to improve at a task, so can computers. Say you need a computer that can tell the difference between a picture of a dog and a picture of a cat. You could begin by feeding it images and telling it, this one's a dog, that one's a cat. A computer program to learn will seek statistical patterns within the data that will enable it to recognise a cat or a dog in the future. It might figure out, on its own, that cats have shorter noses and that dogs come in a larger variety of sizes, and then represent that information numerically, organising it in space. But, crucially, it's the computer, not the programmer, that identifies those patterns and establishes the algorithm by which future data will be sorted. One example of a simple yet highly effective algorithm is to find the optimal line separating cats from dogs. When the computer sees a new picture, it checks which side of the line it falls on and then says either cat or dog. But of course there can be mistakes. The more data the computer receives, the more finely tuned its algorithm becomes and the more accurate it can be in its predictions. Machine learning is already widely applied. It's the technology behind facial recognition, text and speech recognition, spam filters on your inbox, online shopping or viewing recommendations, credit card fraud detection and so much more. At the University of Oxford, machine learning researchers are combining statistics and computer science to build algorithms that can solve more complex problems more efficiently using less computing power. From medical diagnoses to social media, the potential of machine learning to transform our world is truly mind-blowing. To find out more about... So with that, we have recapped what machine learning is. And let's recap how the process of machine learning goes, okay? So... Suppose you have a great business idea, and you've already gone through the effort to frame it as a machine learning problem. What next? How does your idea become a working machine learning solution? The process has three phases, data, modeling, and production. In the data phase, you identify the input data that your machine learning system needs to make successful predictions. Data may come from databases, log files, web pages, and even other machine learning systems. Once you identify data inputs and sources, you use statistical tools to draw insights about the data. The better you know your data, the more useful hypotheses you can make. Data rarely comes in an ideal state. Data needs to be collated, possibly by joining different data sources, and cleaned for the machine learning model to work optimally. Cleaner data results in better predictions. For a machine learning problem, you start with the input data and convert it into features. Features are key properties of the data. For a supervised machine learning problem, you transform the outcome into labels. Labels represent the intended output of the machine learning system. Joining data sources, cleaning the data, and engineering the features and labels takes time. Plan on spending a large portion of your time in the data phase. Modeling phase. Along with the features and labels, you set up the kind of machine learning system needed, called the model. Researchers have created all sorts of machine learning models, from simple to complex. 
Some models classify data. Other models predict numeric values. Tools like Google's TensorFlow support many types of machine learning models for various uses. Before a model can make predictions, it needs training, which is like sending the model to school. First, there are lessons to learn from the data. Along the way, there are quizzes to check knowledge and correct any misunderstandings. In the end, there's a final exam. When training the model, you split the data into three sets, training, validation, and test. The training set corresponds to lessons. Here, the model processes data for the first time. It starts to infer patterns in the data to help make predictions. After you've trained the model once, you quiz it using the validation set. Based on how well the model does on the quiz, you may decide to adjust the model settings or hyperparameters, which are like dials and switches for changing the model's behavior, and retrain the model again to give it the quiz again. The goal is to iteratively find settings that provide the best model quality on the validation set. When the model meets your success criteria, it's time for the final exam. Feed your model the test set. If the model predicts well, it passes the course and is ready for real use. Once your ML system is ready for the world, it's time to move the system into production. For starters, your system may need integration into a product. You need to figure out what this integration looks like and whether your model interacts with users. Models may need retraining on a regular basis with new data to pick up on new patterns or trends. This training could come from new data sets or from interactions with users. The system needs monitoring. This means tracking system outages, errors, data processing volume and speed, and how successfully it predicts results. Machine learning systems also require maintenance. As with any production system, this means fixing bugs, adding features that didn't make it into version one and the like. Machine learning specific maintenance could include testing other models and settings to see if performance improves. So that was the video which showed us how an idea is implemented and how a machine model is first trained and then it's deployed. So in this uh, session, we talked about what is artificial intelligence. We talked about uh, what is the difference between machine learning and deep learning and artificial intelligence. We also talked about the different types of machine learning, that is supervised machine learning, unsupervised and reinforcement learning. We also uh, looked at the examples for each of these and we looked at what is the process like from data collection to model deployment. And we also looked at the challenges that we face while uh, training a machine learning model. Now I'd like to introduce you all to crowdsource. Now talking about crowdsource, what crowdsource is. So crowdsource Android and web app allows users to answer quick questions in a gamified UI and help generate diverse training data for machine learning. Now, what does this mean? So crowdsource is an application by Google with the help of which Google makes common people like us contributors so that we could we can answer quick questions in their uh, application that is crowdsource in a gamified UI. So what happens is suppose you have uh, a level where you have to check whether the given photo is of a cat or of a dog. So once you have given your opinion, you are going to get points for that and you will climb up the contributor ladder. So this is just like a game, but you are actually helping Google by giving them your input, by giving them your opinions. And Google is actually going to use this data to improve on their machine learning models and thus create better products. So that is what crowdsource is. I'd like uh, to recommend you all to please try this app. You can find it on Google Store. And it's a very fun app. And the layout is completely of a game. So you are really going to enjoy it. With that, I'd like to end the session here. If you have any questions, you are welcome to ask them. Thank you. What is the difference between machine learning algorithm and data structure algorithm? 
So in machine learning algorithm, what happens is that you are given a lot of data and you have to use that data to make predictions for the future or you have to classify them. But what happens in data structures is in data structures, you are trying to organize the data, how it's stored and how it's retrieved. So that is data structures. But in machine learning, you are using it to make predictions for the future. So that is the basic difference between both these. So the same algorithm of data structure may be applied in the machine learning or not? Uh, data structures can be applied in order to you know retrieve the data or to store the data but there are different algorithms for machine learning we have linear regression we have logistic regression we have a lot of classification algorithms so these are used to uh, train machine learning models so it's different from data structures okay if i uh, want to physically make a model so what's the procedure so as we talked earlier, you have to first understand what type of uh, mod, uh, what type of prediction or what type of output you need. Once you have found out what type of output and who are the stakeholders, you can collect data. And once you have collected the data, you clean the data first. So once you have cleaned the data and transformed it, now what happens is you have to distribute the data into two or three parts. For, for example, let's say for a simple model, you uh, uh, distribute the data into two parts. One is training set and the other is tested. So once you have uh, distributed the data, then you can train the machine learning model using Python or you can use R as well, but Python is mostly used for machine learning models. So you can use Pandas, NumPy, scikit-learn, all these libraries to train your models on this data, which you have kept as training data. And then once you have trained the data, and then you can check it on the test data, like how is my model performing? If it's performing well, then you can say, okay, this is the model that I'm going to deploy. Otherwise, you have to do hyperparameter tuning and a lot of other things in order to improve the performance of the model. So that is the whole process, how you're going to train your model. Okay, okay. I have heard from my friends and my colleagues that uh, if uh, you have to make some physical model or you have to do something in machine learning, so you have to learn the python but why python yes. i don't i don't able to know why not uh, because in python you have a lot of libraries and a lot of work has been already done for example if i have to implement logistic regression i don't have to write the whole function you know to how how is it going to work but in python you have a lot of rich libraries which already have these function it has logistic regression it it has support vector machine. All these are already implemented. They have libraries, and these libraries are very rich. Even for visualization, Python has very rich libraries. So this is the main reason why Python is used for machine learning. So you have to learn Python. OK, now I know why I have to learn Python. OK. Any more questions? OK, so clustering. So what happens is? Clustering is you have a lot of data points and what you have to do is you have to group them together according to the similarities they have. Suppose we talked about that example, right? Suppose I have six elements and three of them are apples and three of them are bananas. So what happens is the machine learning model is going to see, okay, this is the element. These are the elements which are same in the color and they have the same shape. So I'm going to cluster them all together. What clustering means is it's going to group the same type of data together. So suppose it has seen that, okay, these three have the same red color and they have the same brown shape. So I'm going to group them all together. Then we have, suppose, banana. Banana is yellow in color. It has the same color and it has the same shape, almost same shape. So I'm going to cluster these together. So it basically means you are supposed to group them all together on the basis of some similarities. Any more questions? A little, a little, little more question. Uh, why, if I have to learn the data structure, why I have to learn C++? While if I have to learn machine learning, why Python is required? I am a little more confused in that thing also. Okay, so the thing is, uh, I have some friends who work at very big MNCs and they're working in machine learning and they work with C++. 
but I have heard from them that Python is the language which is being used outside of India as well, and it is the language which is mostly used for uh, machine learning because of the very rich libraries, as I already said. In C++, you have to write a lot of code if you have to implement machine learning. So that's why it's important to learn Python. C++ is good, but Python is mostly used. Earlier, R was also used, but it's been discarded now. So that's why I recommend you to learn Python and some of its libraries. And one thing I also heard about uh, embedded C, what is that? Embedded C would require a lot of extensive code if you have to implement machine learning with that. So that is the thing. These are the languages which are, I, I wouldn't say not made for machine learning, but Python has been you know, kind of optimized for machine learning. You have a lot of work already being done. And we are doing machine learning to save our time, right? We are, we are training machines to do our work simply and in less amount of time. So why use embedded C if you have to write so much code, so much extensive code? So why use embedded C? That's why you, we use Python, because its code is very simple once you have understood the, uh, the syntax and some of its libraries, you have to no, no, no Python and Pandas, NumPy. So that would be fine. So that's fine. Okay, thank you. No problem. Any more questions? Or should we end the session? So oh, I think that's it. Uh, please guys do give us feedback how we can improve and thank you for being such an awesome audience and asking really nice questions. I I really like speaking here. Practical children? Uh -huh. Yes. Will there be a practical session on this? Uh, yes, uh, this was the first session. In the next sessions, we'll be taking uh, some hands-on as well. We'll be discussing various tools which would help in machine learning. This was a theory session. There are going to be uh, hands-on sessions, the next ones. Suraj, you want to ask something? Guys, do fill out the attendance form. It's given in the chat. Okay, guys, so with that, we'll end the session here. For, again, thank you so much for attending the session. And please do attend the next sessions, which are going to take place in the Machine Learning Marathon by GDSC Editor. Thank you so much. <laughs>